Hello, everyone, and welcome to another John Brooks Technical Webinar. My name is Stefan Fedeff, and I'm a technical sales rep for the John Brooks Company. And joining me again today is Chris Chapman, also a technical rep with the uh, John Brooks Company. How are you doing, Chris? I'm pretty good, thanks. You? Good. I can't believe you keep coming back. I know. It's, 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 I think it's the pay. <laughs> I think so. So today uh, we're going to be talking about um, uh, pumping centrifugally uh, viscous fluids, and um, uh, and we're we're probably going to take about 40, 45 minutes. You, as of usual, your microphones will be muted, um, and so if you have any questions, uh, Chris will try and uh, kind of pass them along to me as we go, or maybe leave them to the end. Uh, so just put your comments in the uh, little comment section at the bottom there. So we'll get started. So who is John Brooks? We were established in 1938. We're a privately held Canadian company. I always say it every week, we're very proud of that. And with over 200 of us across Canada. And we're a full service national supplier of pumps, filtration, spray nozzles, custom skid packages, specialized valves and pressure vessels. And again, let us be part of your internal training. If you have any internal training that involves maybe some pumps, pressure vessels, filtration systems, heat exchangers, uh, we'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, free of charge, you know, set up some kind of webinars uh, and custom tailor them to your needs. Okay, so what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover some jello, stress strain, some real cool examples, a pump application, because that's what we have to do, right, Chris? Absolutely, that's what we're here for. And uh, available tools, and then some general results. So let's get started. Rayology, real fancy name, and it's really the study of how matter flows, okay? And I know in, in our business, you know, we don't necessarily have to know a lot about rayology. We just need to know how much that rayology affects our pumping system. So we're not re rayology experts, and we, we're not proclaiming to be but uh, it's how it affects our pumping systems. That's where really we, we really need to know. And uh, two really important factors to rheology is stress and strain. So what is stress? So it can be broken up, into, broken up into two types of stress. There's a normal stress and something else, and we'll talk about that in a second. But normal stress, like any other stress, is really a, a pressure and it's force over area. And normal stress is an area and the force is perpendicular or normal, 90 degrees to the area. So therefore that's why we call it normal stress. And I always like to look at this example here. What exerts more stress or pressure on the floor? Um, an elephant or a ballerina on her tippy toes? Well, I'm setting up the question obviously to work out here. The ballerina on her tippy toes exerts three times more stress because even though she weighs a lot less than the elephant, all that force is over a smaller area. Very basic stuff, but just remember, keep that in the back of your mind all the time. Stress is not all about that force, it's that area component too. So let's take a look at that jello like we spoke about, and it's wobbling away here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring down a knife and we're gonna chop this jello in half. I'm gonna stop it right there. Now there's a lot of science to cutting, and I'm not gonna say this is how cutting objects work, the speeds and feeds, there's all sorts of angles. But in general, there's gonna be a force coming down on that jello, which is gonna be in the form of that knife. And the area is going to be the edge of the knife, real simple. And we all know what's gonna happen then, that knife is gonna come down and slice through the jello. Let's now talk about shear stress. This is the other stress that is really important in rheology. Again, it's the same units, force over area. It's kind of like a pressure here. So now let's hang that jello over a table and have part of it on the table and part of it hanging over. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this strange looking object, it's a flattened out knife, it looks like an iron, and we're gonna start to press down on only half of this jello. Now, we can kind of imagine what's gonna happen. What we wanna do though, is we wanna see what's gonna happen in the middle of this jello. So I'm gonna split this jello in half and let's take a look what's happening inside of this jello as we apply this force. There's this cross-sectional area, okay? And this area that's being affected by this force that's coming down is parallel to the force. Remember before with normal stress, the force and the area were normal to each other. They were 90 degrees to each other. Here, 
the, the force and the area are in the same plane. They're parallel to each other. That's the big difference here between normal stress and shear stress. So I like to look at this example here. If I've got a stack of papers and I start to push them from the top down, what I'm doing is I'm applying a force in the direction of which the papers are flying. And there is a shear stress in between these papers. Obviously that shear stress is not resistive enough to stop these papers from flying apart. Another example here, when I did this kind of early this morning, I had a, had a thought about this. I've got five uh, pieces of glass here and they're all separate and I'm gonna stack them all together and uh, you can provide any commentary you want right now, Chris. Well, I just wonder what you were doing playing with glass in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I had a thought. So what we have here is stacked up stack of paper and I'm gonna take my business card and I'm gonna push on one edge, just a very top piece of glass. And I'm gonna push it slowly. And as you can see, it's just like the paper. There is a force and there's very little shear that's holding this back. There's very little friction between these pieces of glass. So now what I did was I spread glue between each one of these layers and I let it sit for 10, 15 minutes. And now let's see what happens when I push on the top layer. We start to get a dragging effect because now that, sh that force is being uh, transferred through that glue. There's that shearing action going on. And anyone who kind of knows about fluids, they kind of know where I'm going here. This is what happens to uh, fluids as they move. We start to shear them. The, 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 there start to be some laminar and turbulent flows. So keep this in your mind when we're thinking about rheology. Now, the last part that's really crucial, we had to talk about stress. Now we're gonna talk about strain. Now I always think stress comes first and then strain comes afterwards. That's my kind of thought pattern. And if we take a bar, a tube, whatever, of a certain length, and we put a force on either side, okay? It's gonna happen, possibly if that force is great enough, we're gonna get a deformation. We're going to get an elongation. The same thing would happen if we squeeze this, we would get a reduction in length. And strain is the difference, uh, that delta L, whatever that change in length was, divided by the original length. So Chris, if I were to say I had a, I had a pipe in my basement somewhere, in my backyard, and I stretched it six inches. Am I describing strain? No, you're not. And why not? Because it's gonna depend on the length of that pipe that you started with in the first place. Exactly, not that it would be in my basement, but if I had a pipe that was 10 miles long and I strongly stretched it six inches, that's not a lot of strain. So it all depends on a kind of normalization of what the original length was. So here, this is a little bit dubious as far as scientific goes, but it's a good illustration. We had an original length, those glass sheets, and the delta length, again, slightly dubious, but a real good thought extra, uh, uh, experiment. Your delta L, your change in length, is that how much change we had in that slipping. And again, that would be the strain in this case. Again, a little bit dubious, but really good uh, illustration as far as a mental experiment goes. So rheology, let's now take this to a block of fluid. I know they don't exist in blocks, but we've got to kind of go there. If I've got a little right over here, I've got a block of fluid and here I've got a force, very small right now. And if I increase that force, I'm going to hopefully somehow increase the shearing on that block or on that fluid. And if I were to, to plot this, stress going up the vertical and shear rate going along the bottom, the way I'm gonna think of this real simple is stress is kind of like how big that force is getting because it's force divided by area. If the area stays the same, then stress is going to be um, uh, in comparison to the force. So just think about stress as the, the size of that arrow and shear rate is how much motion we're getting out of, out, of the, um, out of the block or the rate of change of that motion. So the first picture we had was a really small stress or a small red arrow and no shear rate, no motion. Then we plot that point zero, zero. Then as the force increased, the stress increased, we get a little bit of shear rate. And we went along and this is the result that we got. This is the result of the, of the shear stress or the viscosity of this fluid. And we would call this Newtonian because it starts out and remains a straight line. 
Now, it does not always have to be at 45 degrees. It doesn't have to be in a one-to-one -one ratio. This is Newtonian. This is Newtonian. It's about, is it a straight relationship? So now let's take another fluid. And now we're going to grow, grow that force. And all of a sudden, we get shearing. So let me just do that one more time. Go back. With the force, we're going to start right now. The force grows, 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 grows. And then we get reaction. How is that going to graph? And what do we call that? Well, let's take a look. We've got the same stress shear plot. We've got zero of each. We're going to plot it. Then we're going to increase the force or the stress, but we get no shear or very little out of it. So let's just, you know, very little dif deformation. Then we increase the force again. We get a little bit more deformation. And finally, we start to get some linear deformation. We start to go into the linear situation. And this is called shear thinning. And there's lots of names for these. These are the names that I grew up with. There's a lot of different names, a lot of different uh, ways of describing this. This is the way I describe it. Um, and this means that this starts out as a stiff liquid, and then all of a sudden, it starts to thin. It starts to give you more shear rate, okay? It starts to deform more as, as, we, as we start to get past a certain stress. And again, this doesn't have to be in that shape. It's how it gets there that gives it the shear thinning uh, name. Finally, one more. We have a force that grows quickly, but the deformation really grows quickly to begin with. And the way that we describe that would be, and I'll kind of cut to the chase here, would be by we're getting a lot of shear rate at very little force or stress change to begin with. And then it goes off into a linear situation. So again, this can be uh, a lot of different shapes. Let me just go back. It could be a lot of different um, uh, shapes as far as when it goes to that linear situation. But what we call this is shear thickening. And again, this is because it starts out, it starts out um, very easy to push, very easy to deform. And then all of a sudden it starts to thicken up. It starts to become more resistive. And this is shear thickening. So if we take a look at all these, Newtonian shear thinning, in that realm, there's Bingham plastic as well, as kind of a form, in my opinion, of shear thinning, and then shear thickening. What we have to look at here is, we're not gonna look up at the slope. They don't all have to be at the same slope. We're gonna look at, were they the, the, the characteristic of that curve before it goes linear? That's what describes these different types of fluids. The characteristic of the curve before it goes linear. And in Newton's case, Newtonian case, it is always linear. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, examples, possibly. Um, shear uh, well, I'm going to show you some. I, I will okay. show some. Yeah, I okay. will show some examples. Yes. Everyone knows about the ketchup and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to show you some right now. So here we go. So this is cornstarch and water. So I think kids call it goop. My 11 year old did mix it up. Um, so what, watch what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take a car and I'm going to throw this toy car against the surface of this fluid. And as you can see, I'm throwing it quite hard. Nothing's happening. Then if I put it in the fluid and I just let it sit there, obviously the force is being reduced. There's not a lot of force now compared to what the force was when I was throwing this car. It's sinking, it's yielding, it's moving. Okay, so what, how do we describe that, Chris? It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Would you like to pump this kind of fluid, Chris? Uh, not really. <laughs> it's good. You know, we can pump it. We can pump lots of fluid here, but this one we'd have to take some care with, right? You know, every fluid can be pumped. We're just going to have to take some real care. So let's just kind of describe this. When it was sitting in on top of that fluid, over time it started to sink. So what kind of fluid is it? How would we describe it? Maybe it's better to describe it from the dynamic set. So let's go back to when I was throwing the car on the surface. Let's describe that first of all. So what we had was we had a lot of force, a lot of stress. That, that, those tires were hitting that, that surface of the fluid and there was a lot of stress right there. There was a lot of stress being applied, but there was no deformation or very little deformation. So maybe I'm a little bit over ambitious by going vertical, but to give, prove the point here, to show the point, there wasn't a lot of shearing taking place. But over time, we didn't take a lot of force. It did not take a lot of stress, a lot of force being applied in order to shear this fluid in a, in a, in a time sense. 
So this is very time related here. And again, the rate, shear rate is a time dependent uh, anyway. It's the rate of change of shear uh, with respect to time. So this is a little bit of a, of a strange one. It is definitely um, time dependent on, on, on this product. Any questions about that, Chris? Uh, nope. Okay. Just to show you a real example of this, we all know our suspension system. We've got a spring and we usually have a, a, a dampener or a shock absorber. If we apply a force really slowly to this tire, we are going to get that spring to deform and we're going to get the shock absorber will deform as well. Okay. If you've ever been at, seen a screen door, the old fashioned screen doors that have got that shock absorber at the end that attaches the screen door to the, um, to, to, to the uh, door, door uh, jam. If you take that off, and you try and squeeze that together really quickly, you're gonna break your arms. It's very difficult because it's a shock absorber. So what happens if we now hit this tire with a real fast shock? That shock absorber is gonna act like a solid. So it's kind of acting like this group that we've just looked at. So every time you drive your car, you've kind of got this going on in your vehicle. Just for fun here, let's just talk quickly about liquefaction. Any of my uh, civil engineering uh, buddies out there, you'll know about this. This is about a non-homogeneous liquid, okay? Or a, or a solution, I guess, if it's non-homogeneous. Right here, I've got sand and water. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a weight, a can of pop on the sand, of wa sand and water, and watch what happens. Then what I'm gonna do is I've got a hand sander, and I'm gonna put it underneath this sand and water, and I'm going to apply it, and I'm gonna vibrate this sand. So let's watch what happens here. It's quite wet. So it's pretty heavy, you know, can of pop is pretty heavy. It's sitting there, no issues. I'm gonna take my sander underneath, apply it to the bottom, and all of a sudden I get liquefaction. Essentially, this homogeneous liquid is kind of broken apart here. And once I vibrated it, it was only the water now that was having to handle that stress. And water isn't the greatest for handling stress and it fell apart. Lesson to everyone, don't build on sandy or soil that has this problem near earthquake regions or your house is going to uh, fall in when we have an earthquake, that's liquefaction. So again, there's homogeneous and then there's non-homogeneous solutions. And there's uh, unfortunately or fortunately, Chris, we have to pump them all, right? Mm -hmm. We do. Okay, so now let's go to a viscous fluids and head loss calculations in piping systems. So there's a lot of information on the internet. We're probably way too much. What I suggest is you always, for anything in engineering or any uh, technical situation, get your trusted sources, test them, understand them, and stick by them. That's what I do. And for years, for almost 25 years, I've used this one book, uh, Cameron Hydraulic. Hey, I'm not saying you have to use it. This is what I use for 90% of what I do. And it gets me by, I have no issues. It doesn't mean I don't go on the internet and look for stuff, but get your trusted um, data. Um, again, uh, there's all good tools out there. Just got to use them correctly. So just going back, let's just define a couple of things here. There's two types of viscosity out there. The first type is this dynamic or absolute viscosity, and it's usually measured in center poise. And all that is, is the slope of this curve, the rise over the run, okay? That's all what that is. So essentially that comes from this experiment that we just performed. Now there's another type of viscosity, which is called kinematic viscosity, which is usually measured in center stokes, or if you're in the old SR, SR units, SSUs, and that comes from taking the values that we got from the first experiment and normalizing them or dividing them by the fluid density. And why do we do this? Well, because um, SSU's kinematic viscosities tend to act um, uh, the, the more realistic under gravitational situations. Um, so they, that tends to be in the pumping world anyway, we tend to use SSU's a whole lot or this kinematic viscosity but well, you'll see them both. Here is a picture of my actual Cameron's hydraulic um, that I was just discussing. And this is what we're gonna use for this example here. And a couple of things I wanna show you here. This is the pages for friction loss for viscous liquids, okay? And it's based on the Darcy formula because now we're dealing with viscous fluids. 
And these values in here are loss in feet of liquid per thousand feet of pipe. We'll look at that in a second. And these two pages describe two inch pipe inside diameter of 2.067 inches, schedule 40 new steel pipe. And this is probably, I don't know, Chris, 30 or 40 of these pages in this book yeah. that are all different pipes and all different diameters, right? There is, yes. Um, definitely worth looking at. If you don't have one, get one. Yes. So, the top shows us the viscosity. And it starts out at very low and it goes to very high. And it's usually about water 31 SSU. And in this case, it goes to about uh, 3000 SSU. And we'll show you that here. Here are the SSUs. Uh, viscosity again, all across the top. And here, two inch diameter pipe, like I said before. And let's pick a value here of 225 US gallons a minute. So flows down the column. And at uh, 7.4 centistoke or 50 SSU, we are going to get a value of 19.9. .9. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's going to be, if I have a thousand feet of two inch pipe and I push 25 gallons a minute through it at a viscosity of 50 SSU, there will be a head loss of about 20 feet of that fluid column. Now, if that fluid has a specific gravity of one, then that's going to be a, a loss of about eight or nine PSI, approximately. So it's showing you the frictional loss in terms of a head, which is great for centrifugal pumps. We've discussed this before many times. So again, you can always, uh, you know, take it back to a, a pressure if you want. Uh, so this is about eight or nine PSI if this is, uh, if this is in a, a specific gravity of one. This also describes what a driving head would require to overcome this uh, friction loss at 25 gallons a minute. We need a column of liquid, if we didn't have a pump, of about 20 feet high in order to drive this liquid at a rate of 25 gallons a minute through this pipe at 50 SSU. And you're saying, but I don't have a thousand feet. How am I gonna work this if I have something less? Well, if I only have a hundred feet, I can still use this, these tables, because all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one tenth of that value and say, I need now only two feet or a little less than one PSI to drive 25 gallons a minute at 50 SSU through 100 feet of this pipe. So it's all in a ratio. The standard, the normalization is a thousand feet of pipe. So let's bring this book to life. This is actually my book again. Let's just fly through here. A lot of numbers and you see those grades. We'll look at those in a second, but if we take a look at this page, remember 25 gallons a minute, it's a little bit off from one page to another. They're not quite lined up. And here is viscosity. Here's water, here's 3000 SSU. And all those values in between are the values of loss. And if you bring this to life, you will see how those losses increase and how they really increase. Chris, I bet you didn't think you had this in your cameras, did you? I wish mine did 3D like that. I know, I know. It's, it's the Harry Potter all over again. Let me just bring these a little closer together because they're not lined up. Let me just bring them closer. And let's analyze what's the, what this is telling us. It's quite dramatic, actually. So what this is telling you is, is at that 25 gallons a minute for water over 1,000 feet of pipe, we're going to have about 12 feet of loss for water and about over 560 feet for something of 3,000 SSU. Now, I don't know about you, Chris, but sometimes I have problems, you know, and I think a lot of people probably do, but what feeling what these SSU values or centistoke values are. So let's take a look. On the left side, you see a blob that's white. That's gonna be our water. And on the right side, you're gonna see a blob that's red. That's gonna be our 3000 SSU. And let's take a look at what they both look like. They're kind of similar, right? They're not totally, uh, crazy and different. Where I see a big difference, and I've got them broken out, is when we start to get some real shearing taking place. When that liquid hits this invisible jar, essentially a square, square jar, and it starts to shear. Here on the water side, when that shearing is high, you can see the resistance to shear. That, that's what viscosity is. A resistance to shear or a resistance to flow is very little and it is all over the place. This liquid isn't staying together. We're on the right side 
uh, with a higher viscosity, it's staying together. It's harder to shear apart. It's like those glass sheets with the glue in between. It's getting harder and harder to move. If we look at the very end, again, not so much shearing now, but if you look at the top here where we still got a lot of turbulence, you can see a difference again. You can see that shearing difference. So again, what's driving this is our stress, strain, and shearing um, mechanisms inside of, these, uh, inside of these fluids. Is that good, Chris? Is that kind of describing it a little bit better, do you think? No, I agree. It's sometimes difficult to visualize what, you know, how, how the different fluids react and uh, what different fluids have, um, have different viscosities and how those slight viscosity changes will affect the pump, which is obviously what we're going to show here. And we all, exactly, we all know but please remember, viscosity and specific gravity really don't have a lot to do with each other. If you remember, oil, very viscous, you know, depending on the, uh, on, on the weight of it, it can be very viscous. But many times, specific gravity, less than one, right? So just be careful when you say, oh, that's a heavier liquid. Uh, be careful. Viscosity is, is, is a different mechanism. So viscosity and centrifugal pumps. We're finally getting to the, to the money shot here, Chris, right? <laughs> Let's have a look at a curve, just a standard centrifugal pump curve here. There's gonna be head or pressure on the left-hand side, flow on the bottom. We're gonna get a uh, pump performance curve, okay? This is pump performance curve on water. Kind of looks generic. Let's look at the input horsepower required. Generically, this is what looks, this is what the horsepower demand looks like for a peripheral vein impeller, let's say. Standard, pretty general stuff. And efficiency, somewhere high in the middle kind of drops off on either side. That's basic stuff. What happens now if we don't pump water? What happens if we pump something of a viscosity, let's say of a thousand SSU? We're gonna get a drop in performance straight away, okay? We're gonna get an increase in horsepower. So what's happening is we're putting, this pump has to put in more energy and gets more performance out. Well, to me, that means you're becoming very, very inefficient. Your efficiency really drops because you're doing less and you're demanding more. Your efficiency is really dropping. And if we now were to relate that, that's the actual curve before I mucked around with it. If we were to actually relate this to that curve again from the book that was related to pipes, I'm gonna try and bring that value, those losses for viscosity back to now what's going, in, going on inside of a pump. Increase viscosity increase friction or that shearing. Let's take a look at this from a different angle now. So right here we've got water. Water sits at 31 SSU. Here we've got a thousand SSU efficiency. That blue curve was efficiency as well in water. A thousand SSU right here. You can see how this is really dropping off and why it is, why that efficiency is dropping off. Because our uh, viscosity or our rate of, uh, our um, uh, viscosity um, uh, resistance to flow or resistance to shear is increasing. So again, what's happening inside the pump with viscous fluids is exactly what was happening inside that pipe. We're trying to shear it, either push it through a pipe or push it through a pump, and we're getting these resistive um, actions. We're trying to slide those two pieces of glass past each, past each other with glue in between. So let's get to our pump application. So we're gonna look at a Gormorup self-priming pump here, manufactured in Canada, a little plug there. We've got a pump case and we've got this vein plate, which is essentially, it's a replaceable part and it acts like the actual volute, okay? It's, it sits really nice and close to the impeller and acts like the volute itself, but it's called a vein plate, it's replaceable. And the magic is right here, it's got a little port, a, a recirculation port, and that's really what makes it self-priming. A few other features as well, but that's a major portion of the self-priming situation. Now, in this case, we're not gonna use this pump in a self-priming situation, it's gonna be flooded. And if you do have to use a self-priming centrifugal pump on a viscous liquid in a self-priming state, give us a call. There's a few wrinkles that we have to check out first, but it, it, it can be done in some cases. So let's put this all back together and there's the impeller. So let's look at what we're doing here. We have a tank, the green tank is, is flooding the suction of the pump and we have a discharge. So we've got static suction on the left-hand side. Uh, we've got a flood. Uh, we've got a viscosity of 100 SSU and specific gravity of one to keep it nice and easy for our calculations. And we've got a static discharge head. 
So all the usual stuff, friction and static, that's all we ever need really in the pump game. And then we've got some fittings too. We've got some valves, we've got some elbows. So let's just rotate this around, make sure we have a good imagination of what this looks like. Again, we've got our static head, our static suction head, it's not a lift. And we've got our static discharge head and then all the friction in between. So let's take a look at the tank. Many times you might get away with this. I know Chris and I, and I know, you know many pump people, we always wanna look at both cases, when the tank is full and when the tank is empty, what those, what those differences in elevation are, because it will affect the pump's performance. So we wanna look at both, when the tank is the fullest and when the tank is the emptiest. So let's now take a look at a suction system curve. So we're gonna take a look at all the resistance in the suction side of the pump. So we've got friction first of all, we're gonna count up all those elbows, get an equivalent length, and we're going to get and plot a system resistance. And again, as flow increases, our resistance, our head increases, right? It's in a squared term. Now we've got the lowest portion of the head, that off level. Now that head in that tank is always helping us. It's always flooded, it's always gonna push, it's gonna help us overcome that friction. So it's going to reduce, it's gonna subtract from that friction curve. So right there now is the new low tank level. It's subtracted from that now pale system curve, uh, friction curve. Then what we have to do is you have to look at the highest level in the tank, and we're gonna subtract that from the original friction. And now we have two friction system curves. Let's leave this story alone, let's go to the discharge. We've done what we needed to do there. Discharge, we're gonna look at the discharge head, which is the point at which the, uh, the, 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 the uh, discharge pipe leaves the pump to the highest point in the uh, system. We're gonna add the friction in the pipe, so we have to worry about the valves and all the equivalent lengths. And we are going to get static head and friction. And that is our discharge system curve. What do we do when we wanna now find out what the pump actually has to pump against? We have to merge these two values together. So we're gonna lay those, uh, those uh, suction curves over the discharge curve, and we're going to, I'm gonna use this loosely, we're gonna add them together. And we're gonna come up with a low tank and a high tank. Now when I said add them together, be careful. We're adding them, but we're actually adding the ordinates. If the ordinates are negative, then we're adding a negative. So just be careful about that. So now we have to choose a pump. And if we already have a pump in place, we know to get different performance out of a pump or a radial vein impeller pump, what we can do is either change the impeller speed or change the diameter of the impeller. So here we would normally pick up a pump curve, which has got all these curves on it. And what they're showing is either an impeller trim, a diameter change, or a speed change. And we would know where we're trying to shoot for, for, for a, a, a flow ring. And we would reduce all these options to one um, impeller diameter and one impeller speed. And then we would go, maybe the worst case would be at the, uh, at the lowest level in that suction tank. Worst case for the pump, it has to do the most work. And right here would be the system curve laid over the top of the pump curve, just as always. This is kind of a bit of a review from our past sessions. And now we want 55 gallons a minute, let's say. So therefore we need to run this pump at 2,900 RPM, just like any other system curve. Be careful. This is showing our horsepower required on water, specific gravity of one with a viscosity of water, 31.5 SSUs. So that's half a horsepower required. And over here, 0.75 horsepower required. So on that green line, in order to cover it on water, we would probably wanna put a three quarter horsepower motor and we should cover that whole curve on water with a viscosity of water. So, what happens now if we change that viscosity? What happens if we now change that viscosity? It's the same liquid, but it's the winter. 
and all of a sudden this the viscosity of the fluid is it is become higher it's at 100 ssu so what do we do well there are these tables and there's all sorts of these tables around these are the ones from the, i believe the hydraulic institute they're in the camerons as well and they're broken up into two tables one is for smaller pumps from 10 gallons a minute to 100 gallons a minute and the other one is for larger pumps from 100 gallons a minute onward to a certain degree and be very careful these are designed to be around the best efficiency point which we are okay we are around the best efficiency point of this pump so what we do is we get real close to this curve and we look at our flow rate 55 gallons a minute or whatever it is in liters per second right here 55 gallons a minute and we fire a line straight up then what we do is we look at our head and if you looked back it was 26 feet of head or eight meters so we go down here in our head and we look at this is 20 this is 30 so this is 26 feet and we fire a line straight up and where that intersects is a crucial point because now what we're going to do is we're going to now look at our viscosity 100 ssu right here we're going to fire that line straight up on that 100 ssu and now we're going to look at these horizontal lines i'm going to flash them quickly here we're going to look at these horizontal lines and we're going to take our line from our point that we found and let it intersect that ssu line then we're going to drive straight up and look at our correction factors it sounded long-winded it really is very basic and very simple and the example is actually built into the into the graph itself so here what this is telling us is on the on 100 ssu under these conditions near the best efficiency point of these this pump we have to derate our efficiency by 0.8 our ce our deration factor of our efficiency our, our efficiency correction factor is 0.8 our flow correction factor is 0.9 and our head actually goes up a little bit uh chris and i've had discussions about this a little bit murky but i can i can see why the head could go up a little bit at certain points so now when we thought that we on water were going to operate at this point when we apply these corrections we're actually operating a little further to the left now don't let this deceive you this just happens to fall on this green curve this the same speed curve it didn't necessarily have to it's just where the numbers fell out now that to me chris that's not too bad really you're not really losing a whole lot here are you no you're not the difference between 31 ssus and 100 isn't significant what do you think is going to be the significant factor in in viscosity yeah what do you think is going to hurt us here because right now nothing's hurting me i think i'm doing pretty well i've lost a little bit of flow i've gained a little bit of head what what do you think is going to hurt us um hundreds of ssus hundreds of ssus but in this case that power increase right sure, the whole, i see what you're saying I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the, the horsepower the horsepower increase yes yes so even though we're doing less and we can maybe survive hey what's it what's a few gallons a minute less but it's cost 25 percent more in horsepower so if you did not have enough horsepower in your pocket and put enough horsepower in that motor or maybe that pump can't handle transmitting this horsepower in this case it, it obviously can um you'd be in trouble here so to me viscosity it affects a lot of things but number one what i'm going to be looking for is that power increase because i know that's going to hurt me the worst i would think because when it comes down to system calculations, I mean, that slight reduction in flow is, could be built into errors within your calculations. It anyway. definitely, it so definitely it, could be. Yes. 50, between 48 and 55 gallons a minute is probably indiscernible. Probably, yes. Yes, in, in this situation anyway, on a bulk off, offload maybe. Yes, agreed. Now, you rose, raised a good point though, Chris. Um, let's hope that we did calculate this um, did we calculate that system curve on water or did we calculate it on 100 SSU? That's the question. Now, we did calculate it on 100 SSU, okay, because we used those charts. But if you didn't, then not only did you derate the pump, but now it's even got more resistive because you didn't, you forgot to derate the system when you're doing your calculations and you kept it at water. But you know in the winter it's not going to be water. Your friction curves, remember all those in the book, those blue bar graphs, 
they're going to be in a different place than what you remember or what you should be for water. So it's going to hurt you again. So for me, viscosity hurt, can hurt you twice. And it can hurt you in the pump selection and it can hurt you in the, uh, in the actual system as well. Because that's where the fluid is. Again, that, that table shows you it really doesn't matter what's happening. As soon as you start shearing this fluid, whether in the pump or in a piping system, in a valve, in an elbow, it's going to react in a similar way. So use those tables as a, as a bit of an indicator what's going to happen to that fluid. So throw away the old tables. What do you think, Chris? Should we throw them away? They are long-winded. They are long-winded. There's an easier way. There always is. And I always seem to get to the easier way at the end of these things, don't I? I don't know why I can't just get to the point. But right here, you might want to talk about this. Uh, I'll just set you up here, Chris. Uh, you know, most pump manufacturers have software. And here, Chris, you ran this for me yesterday. And you it's, usually me, it's usually me that generates the easy stuff for Steph because um, <laughs> I need it easy. So basically, yeah, I mean, finished Thompson, not, not to make this a plug, but at the end of the day, it's a chemical pump. So, you know, we, we, with these units, we're going to be seeing varying viscosities and very, varying specific gravities. So um, a lot of manufacturers that are used to pumping a lot of various chemicals with, with various um, kind of uh, consistencies of fluid will generate um, selection programs. So, you know, Steph's got highlighted here, you know, the flow we put in, the specific gravity, and then you'll see obviously the key one is that viscosity box that, that we've been chatting about. But then this also allows you to um, select pipe sizes so that it actually generate your duty point um, based on the viscosity that you've put in there. Um, I don't know which other slides you have there, Steph. But you yeah, I just I was gonna show now you hit calculate and then you get all this back. Wonderful. So, so at 300 SSUs um, at 100 gallons a minute with that pipe length with no elbows, 137 feet ahead. Um, okay. So it's taken that viscosity into account to generate that information. And then you get this. At th this oh, sorry, this is at, yeah, this is at 300 SSU. You, 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 get, you get it corrected, right? This is corrected for 300 SSU, correct? 65 uh, centers, though, Chris? Yes, it is. So once you've generated that and you basically then say, select me a pump based on my required head and my, my required um, um, flow, this isn't the same example as the previous one. So ignore the fact that it says 30 feet ahead and we're at 137, the two different examples. But essentially what this has done is it's actually derated everything based on 300 SSUs. Um, so it's giving you the derated flow, the increase in, in performance requirements for that viscosity, and then also your derated efficiency. So if we were to do the same thing against water uh, and select the exact same pump, you know, obviously we would then see a different, different curve and different performances based on water. And, and this is all, obviously, this isn't tested. It, this, is, this is usually by manufacturers. This is all calculated, right? I, I would think so, yeah. 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 So, like Chris had mentioned there, you got your well, everything you need. You got your flow against your head, power, and efficiency. And what about the system curve? Well, all you have to do is now keep everything the same, change your gallons a minute here or your liters per second, whatever's easiest, and this is going to change. And you do that a couple of times, and you can plot your system curve. So, kind of using the manufacturer kind of for your benefit here, it can generate a system curve for you as well. But please be very careful. This is mentioned all the time, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you've got a product that has an apparent viscosity, now apparent viscosity to me is whatever that, um, whatever that viscosity is at any one time in that ever-changing sheer stress relationship, you know, be careful because you might have something that's maybe on the left-hand side where that viscosity is really, really high, that, sh that, that, that uh, rate of change, that slope, and then it thins out later. Please be careful. You know what your, vis what your liquid and how it reacts, the rheology of it, because you may be in a bad spot in that liquid. Um, here, just to kind of wrap it up, Chris, a uh, little example here, a little test for us here. We've got a pump, it's pumping water. Running at 2,900 RPM, discharge pressure 15 PSI. It's flooded. This is a flooded suction, 5 PSI flooded, and a fluid flow of 25 gallons a minute. Motor amperage is 5. If we now pump something, this is, this is a, uh, obviously a centrifugal pump, flooded suction. If we pump something with very low viscosity, uh, lowish viscosity anyway, 
What do we expect to happen here? Well, we're going to keep the speed constant. What do we think the discharge pressure is going to do, Chris? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. So I'm not telling you enough information, but what, what's the option here? Uh, I'd say it could go up. It, it could go up. It definitely could go up because maybe it all depends on how far our flow goes down. Because if our flow goes down just a little bit, then the viscosity that's taking place to run through that, that pipe uh, could actually increase our discharge a little bit. It may drop as well. Same thing here on the suction side. Because it's flooded, we're going to get more resistance, most likely, maybe not if we pump less, and we'll probably see a drop. Our fluid flow will definitely drop, it's just by how much, and our amperage will definitely go up. Now what's gonna happen if we put quite an aggressive high vis viscosity liquid into this pump? Well, speed's gonna stay constant. We're probably going to seriously drop that discharge pressure. Um, our suction pressure is, is again, we're gonna have a lot more resistance. And then finally, fluid flow is gonna really, really come down and then our motor horsepower is going to go up. So efficiency is going to really, really take a hit here. So again, um, once you get to a certain point, and again, I don't want to say what that certain point is with centrifugal pumps because there's all sorts out there, there's all types out there, but you've got to get to a certain point where you're going to want to start going positive displacement. It's going to cost you a lot if you don't, as, as far as efficiency goes, and you just won't be able to. You're going to break shafts at the end of the day. So Chris, are there any questions? It was around, see, I told you it was gonna be a little bit shorter. So got a couple of questions. Um, the 0.8 factor is, is, is a, is a, was a 20% reduction. I think was back on one of the curves there. Um, someone was just clarifying that that 0.8. Um, well, no, because it's, it, it's one divided by 0.8, right. sure. which is 25, which 25. is, yes, okay. exactly. It all depends, it's, it, it's all uh, how you describe it. Um, temperature. So, I mean, this is a tough one. We're really not fluid experts as such. One of the questions was, you know, does, um, do all fluids act the same under temperature? I don't know anything I've ever pumped. I would say that it gets thicker as it gets colder, but I'm sure there's other, other chemicals out there that I don't know. Yeah, I would hate to say, I agree with you that, hey, yeah, usually, but I bet you there's something out there that's, um, that's weird that would do, do a little different. Yeah, I agree with you. Does air added to a fluid lower the viscosity? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I not don't of, know. Probably not of the actual fluid. So fluid. now you're dealing with a non-homogeneous solution because you've got air and you've got the fluid. So the actual fluid itself is probably going to stay the same. It has to stay the same. It's just now you've got a non-homogeneous. You've got that sand and that water. Yes. You know, so it's how it's all going to react. How small are these bubbles of air? That's probably going to be a factor of it. If it's one big bubble, no. If, you know, if it's a lot of little bubbles, if it's entrained, then probably I would think it's going to shear a lot easier. That would be my thought. And it's a shame we don't have the Timmy's card to give away because somebody has asked, is that drop in the resistance in the middle of your 3D curve related to the change in turbulent to laminar flow? Wow. I forgot to ask you that, Chris, didn't I? Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to go back because it is worth it is worth that because we we meant to kind of go through that, didn't we, Chris? And it's a real good, 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 good question. Right here, right here. Do you see that? And that's probably not the best picture. Give me a second. No, uh, go down one. Actually, I got one even better. I think it's right here. When it's, oh, maybe you're right. You saying go down one? Yeah. Right there. See that right there? So we're getting, we're getting resistance, 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 resistance. And then all of a sudden we drop down and then we get resistance again. And Chris, you can explain that. The, the person already did. The person already did. Uh, it's the change from turbulent, it's a, it's a change from turbulent flow to laminar flow. So you get a, I guess it, it, in my simple brain, um, it starts to help um, the, help the fluid move through the pipe to get a little less resistance. So therefore you get a dip before it goes back up again. Yeah, that profile, anyone who remembers any of those fluid classes, that profile changes, right? Um, and it becomes more, more bull-nosed and, 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 uh, and, and actually, uh, no, it becomes more like a bullet nose. Um, so yes, that's right. And in the cameras, it shows you this because in most pages it does. All those under laminar flow conditions 
are grayed out in that whole table. So it shows you that. Oh, someone was on the ball. Too bad. Do you don't have their name, do you, Chris? No, it said anonymous attendee. So, oh, okay. you know, okay. it, it, didn't, um, it didn't say. Um, we have just had a flurry of questions. Um, VFDs on viscous liquids at what range, considering VFD would be feasible? Um, totally, that's pump related, not VFD related. Yeah. Totally pump related. Uh, VFD is just going to be changing the speed. Uh, I wouldn't, I, you know, VFD would obviously, you'd have to size it for that horse, for the amperage, sorry, Adrian, for the amperage, essentially horsepower in our terminology, but the amperage, but really and truly, it's it's going to be driven by viscosity and the performance of that pump. The VFD is kind of out of that picture. But is it going to help you in a viscous product? Is it going to help you if the, if the product, you know, if the, depending on which fact, which, which, what the product is, do you, can you start slow, ramp the pump, pump up to get it going? That's um, a good point. Uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, or work on a closed valve, get the product warm, or, or, or a partially closed valve on the discharge side, get it, get it warm, you know, uh, that, that sometimes can, can, can help too. Um, yeah, possibly, possibly. You, again, your torque start is going to be a little more difficult too. You're going to be now trying to start um, locked in this kind of honey product if it's that viscous. Um, all good, very good questions that are very specific definitely worth looking into in under each each case and then uh, another question we've got a time for a couple more is um at what point do you go from centrifugal to to pd um i hate to give a number there's numbers out there i've got charts all around me that tell me those numbers i really i i you know um let me just pull up one here i was just trying to get my i was just trying to pull mine yeah. up while i was talking i, I hate to say it because there's going to be one, you know, we, we've got a lot of pumps that are very low shear pumps that'll sit on the very right ragged edges of that. Then we've got some pumps, you know, radial vein, high shear, which you won't even want to get close, you know. To, I, have, I have some charts with some roundabout numbers of, you know, 500 SSUs, but even then, you know, it's, it's, it's each application, each fluid is still worth looking into. Yeah, yeah, you could go higher than that, for, for, I would think for sure. Uh, but again, very specific. And you know what? I don't mess around with this. Um, we get that information. And if we have an initial selection, when I'm getting into those, those high viscosities, I'm going back to that manufacturer because guess who knows their product the best? The manufacturer. Mm -hmm. All these tables that we've used today are very basic tables that are generic. If I need to know the losses through a valve on viscous liquid, I'm going back to the manufacturer of that valve. So again, we can only talk general, but lean on the manufacturers and, and us, we're the manufacturers reps. So lean on us and we lean on the manufacturers because they know their products the best. Uh, can I download the Cameron book? I tell you, it's been a long time since I've bought one. I think my last one is seven years old and it's still, it's still a hardback. I don't know whether it can be downloaded. It's probably on some, some website somewhere. You probably could, I, I haven't seen it, but yeah, you can probably. That's it, Chris. That's it. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, appreciate the time. Um, as always, it's a lot of fun. And if you have any feedback, please let us know. And if you want to do a, a little webinar anytime, you know, get a few people together and uh, we'll definitely be more than happy. I'm told, the, I'm told that Cameron's is on Amazon. Okay. Excellent. So it's there I'm not giving up mine. I've got all no. the little sheet notes in it. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks Thank very much, everyone. Thanks appreciate so. it. Have a great day. Bye-bye.